So today, the CLC lecture is titled Environment Sustainability, the Singapore Journey. We have three distinguished panelists, uh, Mr. Lo Atuan, who is a member of CLC's panel of experts, Ms. Isabella Lo, the chairman of the Singapore Environment Council, and Mr. Liak Tinglit, chairman of the National Environment Agency. So the format of today's lecture will start off with a sharing by each of the panelists, followed by a Q&A session with the audience. The lecture will be moderated by Prof. Pauline Strong, sociologist with the National University of Singapore. For those who are under 50 years old Singaporeans, and for those who are from India, and you'll find that this is Singapore. This was Singapore. The widespread poverty, unemployment, and the next few slides, I'll show you what Singapore was like. This was a slum, if you like, a squatter slum. Houses without proper sanitation, wastewater discharged into the water courses, drains, and it landed up in the in river and so on. Next is this is Chinatown. You look at Chinatown today and Chinatown then, it's totally different. In the daytime, it's a pasam buggy. What is uh, morning market? Refuse, litter, you name it, we have it. It's very poorly, it's, it's, it's very poor. And then this is also a, a close up shot, uh, shot of a storeholder in Chinatown. Poultry slaughtering, can you imagine? All the awful blood and so on go down to the drain. And finally, another river, and then river ended up, sometime ended up a water reservoir also. Therefore, that is the situation in. Singapore. I'd like to share with you one story. And this is to us, to us in the Ministry of Environment. At that time, not only it generates smell, problem, water pollution, and public health hygiene standards is not very high. So we wanted to phase out poultry slaughtering in wet market and in, store hold, and in street, uh, roadside store. The greatest Oppose, uh, opposition came from housewives because they need to see a live poultry being slaughtered and they say that's fresh and like to press <laughs> the dressed poultry and so on. Therefore, it took us quite a big effort. Today, my grandson has never seen a live poultry running around. He, the poultry that he knows of is from the supermarket or dressed poultry, sometimes frozen poultry. This is Singapore River. Boat key, the lighters, workers live on it. They actually do their business on the lighters and directly into the water, into the Singapore River. That was Singapore River. And this photograph, if I'm not wrong, was taken in the 60s. So for those who are under 50 years old, I don't think you know, you have seen this before. And of course, pollution, sawmill. This is a sawmill factory in Kranji, northern part of Singapore. There's no control, nothing. You just burn and <laughs> air emission. After our independence in 1965, the government launched into industrialization for the purpose of providing job opportunity, economic development, and so on and so forth. But this is brought about. What does it brought about? The rapid industrialization, urbanization, economic development, and population increase. It put a lot of tremendous pressure on environment, on water resources, something Singapore is really, really short of. Therefore, that was a huge problem for us. In spite of the rapid economic development, in spite of the industrialization, economic development, population increase, we managed to make the air in Singapore clean. We can have, we have drinking water directly from the tap, which is not very common in, 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 in many cities in the world. In fact, there are very few cities in the world you can drink water directly from the tap and you don't get diarrhea. And waste is collected every day. If we don't collect waste every day in Singapore with a hot and humid climate, weather in Singapore, what happened? It is a potential health hazard. With all that, we manage to maintain and keep up a high standard of public health. We managed to do all that. How did we do that? How did we achieve that? This is where I'm going to share with you the Singapore environment journey right from the start. 
It starts right from the top. We must have a very clear vision. What is it that you want to achieve? That vision is to have a clean, green, and a good living environment. And you look at this vision. This vision essentially is meant for our generation, not only that, but for generations to come. A clean, green, and good living environment. And this vision is also it's an attraction so that we are able to attract investment into Singapore, attract talents, retain talents, and support economic growth. No point to have a clean, green living environment. You, there's no economic development. Therefore, this is very key. Now, how do, how do you translate? How do you realize this vision? We were fortunate. There was, and there still is, I hope, political wisdom and leadership. In balancing economic development, social progress, and environment protection. If you look at this, these three are the three pillars of sustainable development. In other words, you balance economic development, social progress, and environment protection. It is sustainable development. This term sustainable de development was first coined in 1992 in the World Earth Summit in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro. But in Singapore, since our independence in 1965, our political leader, leaders has a wisdom of already doing so, implementing, balancing economic growth, balance uh, with social progress and environmental protection. It indicated that, it demonstrated that our political leadership in way back our pioneer generation leaders already doing what every country is trying to do, sustainable development. They have the foresight. The only trouble with our political leaders at that time is that they did not come up with a sexy term like sustainable development. They just do it. They know what they are trying to do. So we were fortunate. How do you translate vision into reality? A vision is nothing but a statement if you cannot translate it into reality. It's just a statement. Clean, green, living environment is it's a very good Call, but you've got to translate it. So the key is that in Singapore, as far as environment is concerned, long-term planning. We need to plan long-term. There's stopgap measures is going to help. It's not going to help you. We need to have innovation on policy and technology. We need to be pragmatic and effective in our approach. I'll quickly jump into the guiding principles. How we did it. The principle, you, you must have a set of principles to guide us in order to achieve environment sustainability. First, control pollution as source. End of pipe solution is not going to help you the problem. Singapore in the 60s and 70s, we are competing with cities like Hong Kong, Taipei, Seoul, and so on. They went ahead very fast because they developed first, they tried to clean up later. Now, this approach has several problems. One, you damage the environment to begin with, which may be irreparable. Two, by the time you want to clean up, it is too costly, way too costly. Three, you may not even have a space to put in pollution control facilities in order to control, uh, to, in order to, to control the waste discharges. The Therefore, control pollution as source is key. That's why right from the start in Singapore, this guiding principle is very important. We, today, National Environment Agency still adhere to this control pollution as source. The second principle is polluter pay principle. Very, is common sense, commonsensical. But unfortunately, I have been to many cities around this region, and in fact, around the world, before I retired and after I retired. And this, Common sense is not common at all. It's really not common at all. Therefore, whoever is, is whoever pollutes you pay, but it's not common. This common sense is not common at all. But Singapore, we adopted this guiding principle. Third is that you must preempt and take early action. Therefore, we must see what's ahead of us 
and we take early action. Prevention is better than cure. And the fourth is innovation and technology. This morning, I've just spoken to some of my Indian colleagues about technology and so on. There are technologies, there are technologies. Just be careful what kind of technology will suit you. Like for example, I talked about that this morning to my Indian colleagues. For municipal solid waste, there are lots of investment technology around. So if you use fluidized bed technology, and this is a very good technology, but it's not suitable for this type of waste. Therefore, I've seen fluidized bed technology plan for municipal waste incineration in China totally <laughs> fail. You can't do that. Therefore, you've got to be a bit... You see, the industry will try to sell you things. Believe me, you. You talk to the practitioners. They'll tell you otherwise. Then resource conservation. In Singapore, we don't have we're limited resources. Therefore, you've got to go. Resource conservation is a guiding principle. Environmental ownership. To me, Beside environmental planning, this is the key. All through my 35 years professional career in the Ministry of Environment, National Environment Agency, this is the key. Because Singapore doesn't belong to PAP government or Ministry of the Environment or National Environment Agency. Singapore belongs to all of us. I have was in charge of Littering at one stage in the 80s. I was so fed up with those guys littering. I, they got caught, I pulled them out. I said, do you simply throw things in your house? He said, no. Then why do you do that outside your house? The reply came back, appalled me. Their reply was, the government will clean it up. What's the problem? Therein lies a problem. There's no ownership. We are talking about environment education, which I'll talk a little bit about, about it. It all, environment education lead into finally environmental ownership. Where we have done well, where we have failed. The key strategy, like I said, is to incorporate environment factors into land use planning. Right from the start, if you factor in all these, you build a very, very solid foundation. You know exactly what you have, what you're gonna do. There's places, heavy industry group together and so on and so forth. You must factor in it. We had lots, we, I had lots of argument and quarrels with the Urban Redevelopment Authority, URA, who, who, is, who, who was a chief planner of Singapore. But we fight, we argue, finally, at the end of the day, we all understand each other. What are we trying to do? We are all trying to, we are doing it for the good of Singapore. Environment infrastructure. Here, environment infrastructure means two things. One, wastewater. Two, solid waste. In any activity, in, where there are human beings, there are activities, there will be solid waste. There will be wastewater. Therefore, you need to take care of it. Therefore you must have comprehensive wastewater collection disposal system. You must have comprehensive integrated solid waste management. And this Singapore has done. Third is environment legislation enforcement. In environment, we don't believe introducing laws that we can't enforce. If you do that, it's become a mockery. Like for example, we, recycling rate in Singapore has, been, has stagnated at about 15% for many years. Then in the late 90s, we were looking at it, we were asking ourselves, why? Why it stagnated? The reason was that at that time, when we look at solid waste, and we, thought we, 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 we believe that solid waste has value, it has value. Now, if it has value, Private company, commercial sector will come and pick it up and do something about it and make a profit. But unfortunately, it never quite took off. So therefore, it has stagnated for 15, at 15% 15 recycling rate. We decided that we need to introduce something. 
to do it. The quickest way of doing it was to, what do you do? The quickest way is to mandate it, legislation. You can't do that because how are you going to go into somebody's house? 85% of the population live in HDV, high-rise estate, to enforce it. Therefore, we say, no, we go, through the, we go through education. It's a long and painful process, but that should be the way. Environment monitoring is air monitoring, water monitoring. You must know what's the quality of water, what's the quality of air, in order for you to know whether you have done well or done wrong or so on, and also to do future policy. Environment education. Like I said, environment education means three levels. The first level is <laughs> communication. I tell you what is it. Explain to you what I want, to, want you to do. After you have understood that, hopefully you understood that, the next level then we say that we engage you. We create activities, game and so on, so that you have better understanding of the, the message. And after that, we empower you. And that's a difficulty. That's tough. You, if you are empowered, you see somebody litter on the street, if you go and apprehend the guy, then we are there. We are not there yet. The critical success factor is building up environment infrastructure. Communicating the vision, our vision. Building capability and capacity, both in the private sector and the public sector. And we must adopt a very practical and cost-effective measure, uh, efficient approach. Now, we have done reasonably well in terms of performance, but we're not perfect. There are challenges to, to, to overcome. Like Singapore is small, limited natural resources, high living density, rising consumerism, rising ex expectation, aspiration, and so on. And we are getting a lot of pressure in the global stage to do more. Therefore, there are still higher standards to achieve and there are greater awareness and better behavior that we need to do. So we have, as far as environment performance is concerned, clean air, clean water, and so on, yes, we reached a KPI, but we're moving towards environment sustainability. What can we do? What will Singapore be like in 50 years from now? I ask myself this question. I shouldn't be asking myself this question because I'm a retiree. I let my NEA colleagues to answer this question, but I thought hard and long about it. This is my own opinion. Hopefully, uh, if you don't agree with me, please bear with me. I think the key challenges are two. Climate change. It brings about extreme weather. For example, it brings droughts, like, it brings flooding, like, rising sea level, and so on. Now, can you imagine prolonged drought? What are you going to do? Unlike oil and gas, you get international market, you can buy water, uh, buy oil or gas. But water, you don't have such a thing. And worse thing, worse still, all the past data about rainfall may not be relevant at all. Therefore, what you already are doing to increase the capacity, increase water supply, do it now. You are just bringing forward that plan, do it now, increase, to prepare for it. So climate change is a key challenge. I'm just using rainfall drought as an example. The second challenge is complacency. It may be the cancer of our society. You see, I look at my son. He was brought up very differently from I was brought up, right? When I was brought up, I, I don't have telephone, I don't have television, and so on and so on. He don't have a car. When he was born, yes, he, the father has a car, a television, and so on and so forth. It's, it's a given to them. It's a given. Singaporeans expect that this is what it is. So people become complacent. The government becomes complacent. The society becomes complacent. If you're not careful, if we are not careful, Singapore is not careful, what will happen is that you'll go down. Therefore, these are the two key challenges I think that will face Singapore the next 50 years in environment sustainability. Now, look, going forward, we need effective, wise political leadership with a clear vision, balancing economic, social, and environment. Carry on with that. We need that. At that time, we need to tweak it to become better. Public service, effective administration, sound, you, 
using sound economic principle in policy making. One government approach, very important. You break down the silo mentality, one government approach. Get the good guys in, get the scholars in, and we need to have a good public service. Private sector, we need to partner. Because the government need to partner private sector because of the technology, because of the innovative, the way they do things and so on. The people, the people are better educated, they see more, they go out and they, 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 they want more, a different aspiration and so on. Therefore, we need to engage them much, much more in terms of get them to be environment, to have an environmentally responsible lifestyle, environment culture. With this, then resource conservation, 3R, energy efficiency, all that, yeah, you need to do. Important, because Singapore is small, Singapore got no resources and so on. You got no natural resources, I mean. Then research and innovation, yeah, opportunity for green technology, energy, water, climate change. I'm pleased to say that since I retired nine years ago, there's a lot in this area that has been done in Singapore. My personal belief is that let's have a bit of fire in the belly, let's do more. Let's have stretch target, don't be afraid. I've been threatened by minister to sack before, uh, to, uh, the minister threatened to sack me before. I retire with a pension. <laughs> if you believe what you, you, in yourself, you believe that what you do is good for Singapore, you don't have to worry. Even if I, even if I got sacked, I'm quite sure other, other governments in, this, in, in, in the countries of this area will pick me up and private sector will pick me up. Don't worry about it. Global leadership, we have come a long way. We may not be the best, but we are ahead of many, many cities. I think we need to share with other cities. And I really take my hat off of one particular person who is sitting here, sharing his expertise, his knowledge, Dr. Liu Taiker, in China. You go to China, he just mentioned Liu Da Si. Everybody knows. The trouble is that we Singaporeans, we don't know we're such an expert that people look up to. And only when I went to China, start working in China after I retired, then I realized, oh my goodness, we have a man here, an expert, and is very, very well respected in China, no less. Think long term, we must look at the big picture. We must recognize that there is an environmental ability to, move, to meet both present and future needs. There's a limitation in Singapore. And then thirdly, we need the needs of the present do not compromise the ability of the future generation to meet their needs. This is basically sustainable development. We need to recognize that. We have come a long way. We may not have arrived. We have arrived to a certain extent. Therefore, we must be a responsible global citizen. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for your patience. Well, would you believe that they, the organisers, have given me a topic which is about the NGO's perspective of waste management. Uh, so it's a bit narrow, but um, as I'm going to speak to some of the slides that I have up, I will talk about uh, SEC as not just about waste, but the holistic view as well. I mean, air, water, sea, the whole gamut that we're responsible for. And of course, um, what I have a slide up here is really talking through some of the evolution of an NGO. I mean, some of you are from Europe, I think. You balk at this because uh, it looks a bit weird that the government actually gave birth to an NGO. Uh, but in the terms of what a, uh, I was told by United Nations, uh, the term on your immediate, the first step that we started in 1990, uh, basically we were part of an umbilical cord of the uh, ENV in those days, and now it's called the NEA, split NEA, PUB, and then Ministry of Environment. What they call a gongo, all right? A gongo is government-owned NGO, and at that time, 1990s, early 80s, I think Atuan can also uh, ratify that, there, there wasn't really any big Singaporean NGOs. I mean, the community wasn't interested, you know, to do something uh, that would mean that uh, it's hand and mouth or, you know, salaries are not going to be forthcoming. So an NGO of this size was needed, actually it was 
basically formed out of um, the Rio de Janeiro um, summit, right, at that time that we needed to form one. So that's the history behind SEC. And over the five years of evolution, it became a full-fledged NGO. Uh, and it needed to be a full-fledged NGO so that we can stand on our own and raise funds, etc. Sometime about 1999 onwards, uh, it evolved into a what we call a bongo. All right, now you call it a bongo. Again, it's a United Nations term. It's called a business NGO. So we have recurring income in the organization uh, that provides the sustainability that's needed for an NGO to do our work. We're not an activist, uh, but we do advocate uh, in terms of uh, some of the activities that we do, whether it's the haze or whether it's to do with water uh, and the need to uh, basically galvanize communities. So I hope that uh, this is a quite an interesting evolution. And of course, today our mandate is to drive greater awareness, just not in Singapore but to the region. And that's why some of our recurring activities are to do with green labelling um, and uh, what we call uh, green consumerism, uh, not just in Singapore, but in the region. So without further ado, I've got to give you a report card, you know, what we do, so that we, you know, we show you some of the three pillars of our activities, um, accolades that we actually give to companies and individuals. We're independent, you see, so we're a voice that, you know, there's no favours. It's basically we say you're good right in the face or you're not good. So we reward and recognise individuals uh, and achievements and we also tuck in uh, what we call a lot of activities that we do over the years uh, which, which have volunteerism in them. And uh, the other thing that we're starting to do uh, is actually to look at uh, more the activities uh, that are related to the region. So whether it's to do with uh, looking at environmental journalism, nobody's in the space, uh, so we uh, actually are uh, rewarding uh, environmental journalism that actually do report the right things. Uh, we're also a member of GEN, which is the Global Eco Labeling Network, RSPO, which is for the palm oil, and as well as the FSC, which is the Forest Service uh, uh, Council. So without further uh, just that my three-minute uh, advertisement, if you can allow me to, before I go straight into some, some data that is not Googleable. I'm just looking at some young, uh, you know, people at the back. And uh, no, you cannot Google some of these slides. We produce them, okay? But good references. Uh, what is important in this slide is that we decided to show this to all of you today because we felt that we needed to ask questions whether we're doing the right thing in Singapore. Are we actually producing the right behaviour and the ownership? And if you look at the comparison that we have here with Taiwan, South Korea, Hong Kong and Singapore, actually if you Google up today, you'll find that Hong Kong is having a huge debate on uh, whether the pricing of waste was correct and uh, you know they're, uh, they're looking and exploring at how Taiwan and South Korea have got it right. I just wanted to point out some of the key data here. You look at the daily waste disposal in terms of capital, and you see the stark difference. And if you look at the top in terms of population size, you'll see something odd here. I tell you what is odd. All right, Singapore being a very small nation, 5.7 million people, and yet our daily waste disposed per capita is 1.5. Oh goodness. Something's not quite right here. Are, are we that high in terms of consumption or do we have a structural issue that we need to address? Uh, and I'll drill down a little bit more from the lens of an NGO, okay? Uh, in terms of waste management installations, this is quite important because these four different countries actually have different methods of organizing around waste management treatment. Uh, if you can see right to the other end, which is Singapore, we dealt with it very differently. We became efficient. I think part of Atuan's discussion just now in his, in his first speech was we really needed efficiency to get quickly up on the curve in terms of getting waste management settled the last three decades. And so we did it rightfully, what we call in the form of four incineration plants, one offshore landfill. I think there's pockets of what they call materials recycling facilities. Now, what Singapore had done efficiently is that what went to that one offshore landfill isn't for what we call incinerable waste. It's actually for non-incinerable waste compared to the rest of the other 
uh, countries that you have here. But this is quite an important slide. I may go back to it so that we can have another discussion here. But here's another slide that is very important. Then you say, okay, uh, so what did South Korea and Taiwan do right? What did they do right? So if you look carefully at some of the, sli the slide itself, right at the beginning in 1995, where it all began, both Taiwan and South Korea actually practiced what they call a volume fee waste system. So uh, if I can cleverly put this in a very clear and simple uh, language, they actually charge the consumers or the owners of the, of the waste uh, basically by bag, and they bring it down and they get it either weighed or into a system. Uh, so um, it seemed to be working quite effectively, as you can see from the decade after 95, that the waste actually had leveled off. All right, and I will show you a few more interesting statistics. Where is Singapore in all of this? This is very interesting. Singapore is that uh, purple line uh, right now, right there. And of course, Hong Kong is far up there. All right, um, Hong Kong, is struggling. If I can just show you the numbers again in terms of Hong Kong, uh, they have 16 landfills altogether, and they're struggling substantially in terms of getting the people. But we have something in common with Hong Kong. Uh, most of our people actually live in high-rise, uh, densely pop populated uh, so-called housing estates. Okay, if I can just quickly go through some of these, sorry, very very uh, statistics-looking slides, but important to any of our discussion later. Um, Singapore, uh, as you can see, in terms of the 1.5, in terms of daily waste co uh, collection, um, even though it's right on top of it all, um, I need to show you one more slide here, uh, where South Korea had done it right. I mean, I, just, I couldn't get statistics from Taiwan, but if I look at the correlation of waste management and recycling, it is starkly co-joined. So if I want to talk about recycling today for any city, we need to talk about the right waste management behaviors and the right waste management system to get it right. So as in landfill rates at that time in 1994, 95, we're talking about 80%, my God, that goes to landfill. And they cleverly reduced that. And look at the recycling rate that had gone up. Sorry, the number speaks for themselves. I don't have to say very much, uh, but... Uh, they did it right, and uh, if you ask the question, is it sustainable? I think the answer is already uh, quite clearly in the numbers that we showed here. They had sustained it, okay? I don't think they can push any further out. I doubt it very much. Uh, this is the best they can do in terms of the recycling rate for the system that they have going. Um, some of the systems that I just talked about briefly in South Korea, they have a, a system of machines that the households actually bring down uh, and it's measured and it seems to be working quite well. They do have a system where they actually charge still a month per household, a very flat rate, but the variable cost is enough to deter uh, the people's uh, interest. Okay, how do we stack as uh, Singapore? Uh, to the rest of the world. Sorry, the, these, this slide is Googleable. Okay, I took it off from the Google page. But I, I just put in Singapore numbers in there. But I think it's not a slide that you have to say it is the gospel truth because when I actually dug in deeper, there is a difference between the way they look at recycling rate because some of it is not exactly municipal waste recycling. Some of it is actually coloured with what we call uh, construction and industrial waste. So, but... Whatever it is, Singapore is still far better than the other part of the continents today, which is basically America and Latin Americas. I mean, we're still okay in terms of our recycling rate. Right now, it's about 61%. Okay, so this is again throwing you some more slides in terms of our uh, recycling. Uh, but this is the one that I felt that you need to concentrate on for my next part. Uh, in any city, I think some of you are representing other cities right now, this slide actually represents individual segments of where we need to concentrate on. Uh, the first 
one, two, three, four, five bars are actually what we call industrial waste bars. And actually, there's a lot of industries and recycling companies that are very interested in recycling that. In fact, I was told uh, very proudly by an NEA officer that we recycle practically 100% of uh, construction ways, and I think that's driven very cleverly and uh, very well by BCA. But as we go down uh, towards the right side of the waste stream, you'll find that starkly there are a lot that we haven't really covered in terms of recycling activities. One of the ones that uh, the slide also speaks volumes in terms of where the growth of waste is. If I just take any litmus test of a, what we call a developed city uh, profile, you'll find that food waste is very high on the agenda. Actually, it's just amazing uh, that uh, uh, we pay something like 350 uh, a month a household for food. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised with that number. More importantly, Singapore weighs something like two bowls of rice a month, you know, per person. And what is even more stark in terms of numbers is I took this from Marina Bay Sands as we we're working with them. They gave me a statistic of something like 25 tons of food waste that come out of a conference center that size a day. Oh, that, 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 that is just amazing. I mean, you're talking about nine-ton trucks, okay? Just imagine nine-ton garbage truck and just times 10 plus, you know, and you'll find that uh, it's an amazing amount of waste that comes out from uh, any large uh, so-called centers, mice centers and things like that. Okay, um, okay so, so if I may just go back to food waste statistics again, and we look at some of the contrasting numbers. Uh, Taiwan's got it right, uh, and so South Korea too. Oh my goodness, you know, what are we doing wrong here? <laughs> or what we haven't done right yet? Uh, so in terms of South Korea and Taiwan, they really have come up to speed in terms of food waste. They've engaged communities. They have actually depositories of a lot of equipment at the ground floor of a lot of the blocks to get communities uh, to understand that uh, half of their waste profile is actually food waste, and they could actually do a lot with converting it to something else. So, uh, But we're not worse in class. As you can see, Hong Kong is really far off, very far off. Uh, so these are some of the efforts I'm going to show you, but again, these are not exhaustive. There are many activities that are happening right now. Uh, we're working very closely actually with NEA, the government and the community to look at co-digestion, uh, biogas, food systems. We're observing this. We're looking at more outreach programs. We're advertising quickly, telling people, please, please don't waste your food. Take what you need and don't, you know, try and take too much, especially in buffets, etc. So there's a lot of uh, community and ownership uh, on the ground. Uh, however, the way forward is there's still a behavioral issue around uh, food waste. Uh, and maybe, you know, it's not a, going to be a silver bullet to put uh, a waste digestion system uh, in every block. Maybe there needs to be more thought in terms of at source, in terms of where food is right now consumed. So in the, in the SEC, what we're doing is we're actually co-joining with a lot of the uh, so-called landlords, uh, Capital Land. We're talking about uh, CDL to talk to food restauranters about minimizing food waste uh, right up front. It cannot be that we should be looking at the end game, but not at the front end where food is, is being generated. Of course, the supermarkets are also actively participating together with the NGOs. So this is my last slide, <clears throat> okay? Just to end off with, Singapore do have a sustainable blueprint, and it is talking about towards a zero waste nation. We strongly advocate this and we've been strongly uh, engaging communities and especially uh, our young generation as well as uh, the more informed generation, how we can continue uh, to do more. And as you can see right at the bottom, the food waste, we've got some way to go to get it up uh, to say 90% like what South Korea had done. Uh, so many things to discuss. And Thank you so much. Before I start, can I do a quick and dirty survey? I need all of you to be completely honest. How many of you, the last time you went shopping, you actually bring along your reusable bag? Not bad. Not bad. This group is good. Okay. How many of you, when you go and pack your food from the hawker center or from the coffee shop, you bring your own container?
now a bit less. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. I told the chairman that uh, I don't have much to add after Atuan and Isabella gave their talk because I agree with everything they said. So can we just adjourn for discussion? <laughs> I think because of the effort of the first generation, Atuan particularly included, because he is one of the 10 who got the gold medal from Lee Kuan Yew for cleaning up Singapore. And of course, Dr. Liu uh, and his colleague of that generation that completely transformed Singapore. Singapore is where we are. Singapore is not bad. But I think if we are honest about it, we are not great. We are mediocre. Among the first world city, I think we are average. If we talk about sustainability, we are we pale by comparison with Taiwan, with many other cities. Most people don't think very much of it. Most people don't care enough to actually do anything about it. In terms of cleanliness, littering continues to be a huge problem. Right? And if nothing else, we look half decent in terms of cleanliness because we have armies of cleaners sweeping after us. In some places in Singapore, the town council is cleaning three times a day. Right? And if you want to see what truly Singaporeans are, you know, in terms of cleanliness and behavior, wake up a little bit earlier. You know, six o'clock in the morning, go and have a look at some of the HDB area before the cleaners start their work at 6.30. And then you see what we have. And in the hawker center, despite all the effort we put in, the majority of the people do not clear the table, do not return the tray, even if the station is right smack in front of them. This is the reality. But we go around feeling quite comfortable with ourselves. We are okay. I'm here basically to state the ground that I don't think we are okay. <laughs> and I hope those of us who are here will dare to dream of a future for Singapore that is different from what it is today. And then I hope there are enough of you in this room to actually say that I can do something. During Atwan's time, I heard fantastic war stories about the challenges they face, to clear up Chinatown, to build all those things. Uh, if you all have time, I urge you to ask them for a private tutorial. Because when they sit down and explain to you what actually happened is, you know, he didn't have time to tell you all the fascinating that thing that happened, all right, for Singapore to get to where it is. But I saw his guideline that he put up. It was relevant then, completely, completely relevant today. Because if Singapore is going to move forward, we really need to do almost identical thing all over again. So what is it that we need to do? I think we need a very different perspective. I often get the feel when I met many Singaporeans who, like Atuan put it, who are getting complacent. When they look at a prob something, they see it, they define it as a problem, littering problem, lack of participation problem, and it's problem, problem, problem. The problem is when we look at problems, our perspective narrow. We curl up and, and we stay on the ground. We are not looking up in the sky to dream of something bigger. And sometimes, we even try to avoid talking about it. And sometimes, we're in denial. We launch a lot of initiative. It appears in the newspaper in the headline. Look wonderful. Just go down to the ground and see for yourself. It didn't work. And yet, we did not want to talk about the problem. Because seemingly, if we don't talk about it, we will be all right. So we need a different perspective. We need to begin to see problems as opportunity. Shit, by the way, is fertilizer. E-waste is a big problem, but e-waste, you pile it up in a pile, it's actually gold mine. It's actually mined for rare earth. <laughs> See the difference? And I think Singapore, to move forward, we need to have that new perspective. Second, I think we need to dare to dream. Dare to dream big. We are not bad. But is Singapore really that nice environment to live in? There were some articles about noise pollution just two days ago in the newspaper. 
I live in an apartment on the eighth floor next to the PIE. I can tell you, noisy like hell. <laughs> okay. Serious problem with noise pollution. Do we want to talk about it? You want to do something about it? Do we dare to dream and say, can we together create paradise on earth? In my mind, my paradise on earth, from my bedroom, from my living room, I look up, I see greenery. I see beautiful, clear water, not uh, greenish uh, algae field water. Huh? Um, what I have birds singing, butterfly fluttering. Uh, what else? Oh, peace and quiet. Oh, one more. It's nice and cool. All right. I can sleep without turning on the aircon. I could go jogging. I could do outdoor exercise 12 o'clock at noon. All right. Immediately, a lot of people will say, that's impossible. Can't be done. Really? You look carefully somewhere out in the world, somewhere, including in Singapore. What I just described to you is already happening. Someone make a comment that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. <laughs> While many people are either dare not dream or they say it can't be done and spend all their time explaining why something cannot be done, there are people out there that are busy doing it and they are achieving all those results that you say cannot be done. So let's paint that picture of paradise on earth. Because only when you have that dream, then you will start thinking about how do you want to get there. Later at the point of discussion, if you want to challenge my point, we can discuss a bit more. Do we dare to aim for a goal to say that the sun never hit the ground at noon? Right? The sun doesn't hit the ground at noon. And I can tell you, if we can achieve the sun never hit the ground at noon, I think the temperature will be about 5, 6 degrees less than what it is now. Um, if you have not done so, uh, this weekend, why don't you go to MacRitchie at about 11 o'clock and get in there? Do you know that you can actually have a wonderful time uh, even at 11 o'clock when the sun is almost completely out? Because in that kind of environment, you can have a nice and cool environment, which is very, very pleasant. Can we do that and create that for the whole of Singapore? Do we dare to aim and say that this Singapore is a zero-waste society? Now, in nature, there's no waste. In nature, the output of one species is the input of another species. I went trekking in the mountains up in the Himalayas. And um, the guide, you know, there was an awful smell in the valley. So the guide brought us to go and see the remains of a dead buffalo. You know, Himalayas buffaloes are, they are almost the size of a little elephant, right? Huge animal. And the guy told me that the buffalo that we were staring at actually died about three days ago. In that three days, the Himalayas vultures have come in, actually stuck their head in and removed all the innards. The small animals would have gone there to eat up all the other parts, and now the insects and the worms begin to come and crawl around. And the guy told me, within about a week, the whole thing will disappear. <laughs> in nature, they recycle everything. Waste actually is a human concept. We create it into a huge big pile, and then we say we can't get rid of it. And then we just accept the toxic environment that we create. I'd argue that maybe we should think differently, have a different perspective, dare to dream. Do we dare to say Singapore will be the first city to be self-sufficient in food? Can it be done? It can't be done. Not today. But what if we can do it? Think of the economic engine that we will create for maybe Singapore for another 10, 20 years. But do we dare to do it? Beyond what we have done and go to the next level. I think things can happen if you have the right leader. And I think leader is not just the guy on the top. I think it's about leader at every level, particularly at the ground level. Because without the right leaders, nothing will happen. But with the right leader, things can happen. The mayor of Central CDC, Dennis Poir, uh, gave a talk to her staff and she said this, we need leaders with the five C's. 
Uh, her five C's is commitment, courage, competence, and she said character, and finally, completion. Can finish what they can start. All right. And I like that five C. We need that if we want to create a world that is quite different from what it is today. I think we must have a courage to stretch. I think too many people today, their starting point is, I want to make sure nothing goes wrong. By the way, if your focus is nothing go wrong, you should just lie in bed and don't get up because nothing will go wrong. I think the focus should be, how can we make great things happen? But to do that, you must have courage. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the stretch goal. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have something inspirational to aim for. I think part of the competence is the people in charge must be on the ground. I think there are too many people who love having meetings in their office, write beautiful papers, great theories, but it doesn't work on the ground. Uh, when I ask for tutorial from my seniors you know, about what happened in the past, they often cite examples of Lee Kuan Yew, Go King Sui, Hao Yong Chong and all. And one of the most common things that cite completely was, this gentleman always challenged the officer. Will he work on the ground? Yes, this sounds clever, but will he work on the ground? And to make worse for the officer, they will actually go to the ground and look for themselves. And they will give you hell if it doesn't work. And I think if we really want to achieve something bigger, we really need to go back to that. What Atan put up on the slides must be what we will do today and tomorrow. Otherwise, we will just stagnate and nothing much will happen. All right. To keep Singapore clean is actually not that difficult. We just need to be prepared to push. We need leaders. And I think we need to accept that there's no magic bullet. Uh, it is not do more enforcement or do this, do that, and all that kind of stuff. I think we should see the world clearly. It is not the X theory, everybody should be punished. It is not the Y theory, everybody could just be loved to death and then they'll be fine. And oh, by the way, you, you, uh, there are some technology zealots who believe that somehow technology will solve all the problem. All right? I come with this automatic AI and all this thing, they will solve all the problem for me. Nothing like that will happen. I think like Atwan just said, you've got to find things that work, combine all the things together, particularly behavioral science, how to make people do the right thing. It's about shifting the whole social norm. I think it is about getting a society that takes responsibility for themselves. Pauline did a survey for NEA about 10 years ago, and they found that Singaporeans admitted that about two-thirds of the population, they are the good fellows, they never litter. But 30% say that they will litter when there's no convenient dustbin to be around or when nobody is watching. And then there is a small percentage that will always litter, even if they're dustbin. So I call them the good, the bad, and the ugly. You can't treat them all the same. I think we need to persuade the good not only to continue to behave well, but to advocate for it, to put pressure on the rest who do not behave properly to behave. Remind people, please don't litter. Please return the tray. Stand up for it. The bad better behave better. And I think it is a role of the government to punish the ugly who refuse to change. Because only then we have a holistic solution and I think it can happen. Then Singapore will be clean. But bottom line, the government can't do it. It is you and I, all right? As individuals, as managers, as leaders, we play our role. My challenge to everyone here, Dare to dream big, but you have to dig deep. You have to go down to the ground and truly, truly understand what is going on. Start small. Start small. Uh, Edward is uh, busy organizing the Clean Up Singapore. He just sent an email to all of us. Six and seven of May, please gather your colleagues to go and pick litter around your company or your school and your neighborhood. I hope all of you will join him. All right? Start small and then act very fast. And I challenge all of you, don't just say that you care about the environment. 
Actually, do it. All right. Don't pretend. All right. By the way, yeah, you know why I wear a green shirt today? Because some people uh, in the government think that green transportation uh, is painting our bus green. <laughs> I think you need to do a little bit more than painting your bus green <laughs> to be called green transportation. So I listen with great interest, uh, especially Atuan's account of how Singapore was transformed in from the environmental disaster of the 1960s to, you know, a fairly beautiful environmental miracle, right, of the 2000s. I'm a sociologist, so I'm always looking for the triggers. And I want to pose a question. A lot of this, a lot of transformation comes top down. Government decide, government rolls in, and government make things work. I take, you know, then Isabella's point, too, that the rise of the NGO was that GNGO to start off with. Um, so may I invite uh, my, my panelists to comment on this. The difficulty that Mr. Liak has also pointed is how do you get Singaporeans to take ownership and to stand up and to take charge so that it's a sustainable kind of transformation? Um, could it not, might, might it not be that the way we've done things has just encouraged poor behaviour? When I started my career in the early 70s as a young engineer, um, one day my chief engineer said that the PS is calling a meeting. So I went there with my chief engineer and the PS was there very serious looking. In fact, it was Liek Tiang. Uh, he, he said that yesterday evening, the PM said that we clean up Singapore River in 10 years. As a young engineer sitting at the back, taking at that time, there's no computer. No? It's all handwritten. No? I was supposed to be a note taker. I blurted out and said that the PM is crazy. But of course, you know, uh, all the nasty look, you know, the chief engineer director, the perm site was there and so on. So what professor said is quite true. It was top down. I thought that it is near impossibility to clean up Singapore River. If you were in Singapore in the 60s or even the 70s and so on, you will know that within 200 meters away, you don't have to see the river, you know the river is there because of the smell. It was that polluted. For those uh, scientists who know that the water has zero dissolved oxygen. No aquatic life, no fish to speak of and so on. Can you imagine we've got to clean up? So in a way, it's top down. The thing is that as, as good civil servant, then we decide how do we plan, how do we to come up with a master plan, and finally we did it. That is what Mr. Liak has been saying. Uh, let's have the guts and do it. Let's have the courage and do it. Now, the, the thing about sociology, I'm not a sociologist. I always believe that you know, uh, engineers like me, full of engineers, Ministry of the Environment, National Environment Agency, we are pseudo-psychologists, sociologists, and we do everything. Educationists, but we're, we are engineers. We are, Hard to do all that. I recall in the 80s, we started this pu public toilet campaign. Clean, public to clean the public toilet. Everybody was laughing at us. But if we hadn't started that, that I don't believe is top down. It is within the ministry we decided that we ought to do something about the public toilet. Public toilet in coffee shops and so on and so forth is horrible. The point here is that fortunately we recognize that beside cleaning up the public toilets, beside changing the system, the urinal, the better quality and so on and so forth, the key people, the user. What does it mean to us? What does it mean in our campaign? Our campaign strategy was very simple. Be considerate. That's all there is to it. If you are considerate, then it's unlikely that you will 
dirty the public toilet. Then it's easier for cleaners and so on and so forth. But I come back to this point. We were engineers. We, we are still engineers today and so on. But I recall telling my, 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 my PS a few years before I retired, I told him that we need to get true sociologists, true psychologists, and to, to work with a true, true educationist, to work in the ministry agency. You, we cannot continue with a half-baked sociologist, psychologist, you know, like an engineer to, to work on this sort of thing. Therefore, yes, I agree with you. A lot of big projects are top-down, but certain projects, certain things that we do, it's actually, come, I won't call it bottom-up, but at least the ministry, the civil service at the, at the public servant level, we push for certain things. And I like what Ms. Lea is saying. Let's dream big. And this is something that in the old days, I shouldn't say this, but anyway, in the old days, <laughs> whether we dare to dream big, all our bosses dream big, dream big for us, and we, we move forward. And we, we, we have to do it. If you don't dream big, if you don't have a stretch target, you never arrive. Don't have to look at your bosses and say that, ah, what does he want? What does he like? If you start thinking that way, I think we are going downhill very quickly. Um, I've got a different view on this. I think uh, in the 1960s was at that point in time, the, what Artuan had said is really the need to drive change was much harder. Now we are a new nation with new interests. Uh, yes, there's a legacy of what the, you know, the international world call a nanny nation. Um, everything is cleaned after us and uh, if you lift anything off, you find that the people have forgotten what to do. I mean, the responsibility and the ownership we discussed earlier, uh, you know, we haven't really addressed that, uh, which is so different from the other two nations that I just put up uh, of their responsibility. And um, I think if you see, I think they hosted the World Cup there was uh, uh, maybe about four, six years ago in Korea, and the whole world just stared, you know, in amazement when the entire crowd uh, in the stadium got up with a plastic bag and picked up the rubbish behind them. I mean, that is arriving. So how do we arrive uh, to a nation that can be totally engaged uh, for going forward? And another thing that I wanted to add, if I can just jump forward, I mean, we're talking about future ready. I did talk about the transport side, a little bit of Liak said a bit about the green transport. In the green transport space, actually we've arrived. We're starting to hear, uh, you know, personal mobility devices. We're seeing a huge take up rate of people wanting to do the walking the last mile. Um, that kind of thing is, is happening and ownership in the transport space is becoming first world city, future ready. Uh, but what I feel that Singapore may not be ready is in the topic of uh, waste management, maybe um, clean behind you, put your trays back. You know, those are the small things that show that the country actually still needs to grapple with the fact that they should own that space. I got into this area of environment and keep Singapore clean uh, almost by by accident or by whatever. Huh? A couple of years back, uh, one of the ministers approached me and said, can I sort of uh, chair the Public Hygiene Council, uh, whose job is to try to keep Singapore clean. All right? um, to be honest with you, it wasn't something that, uh, you know, I wake up in the morning, want to deal with littering and rubbish kind of stuff. Right? Uh, but I decided to do it mainly because uh, I'm from healthcare. And uh, we were deeply involved during the SARS period when there was a major crisis. And I, I decided to take on the road of keeping Singapore clean from my health anger. Because if we don't change our behavior, particularly in the public toilet, the next time the pandemic hit, we are going to get really, really whack. All right. Um, touch a point then, 
uh, we get complacent because you know it doesn't seem to bother us, you know, and all that stuff. Uh, but you remember, for those of you who are around during SARS, uh, we panicked. Huh? SARS was nothing. It wasn't very, very commutable, so it was wasn't too much of a problem. It just attenuated and then it disappeared. The next time we may not be so lucky. All right. Uh, next time you will find a large number of people dropping dead. You compare our public toilet, for example, with Japanese public toilet. It's a world of a difference. Uh, more recently, I, I go to Korea, I go to Taiwan. And by, what, by the way, yeah, even in many Chinese cities, including the second tier cities, their toilets are cleaner than Singapore. All right. So for the Singaporeans in the audience, open your eyes, and I hope you get concerned and do something. But back to what Prof was asking about, is it because the government have done too much? I think so. The problem with having a super efficient government who is very responsive is that whenever the citizen complain, the civil service react. React in what is expected of them. Dirty, I clean. Dirty some more, I clean some more. So people start saying, the place is dirty. Town council didn't do a good job. Town council fault. No one look at the neighbors who litter every day and say, actually, it's the neighbor's fault. It became a government fault. And when people start saying, oh, I litter because I can't find the dustbin. Not enough dustbin. So at one stage, some of our silver servants furiously add dustbins. Until one day when people challenge me and say, not enough dustbin, and I ask an audience like you, and I say, have any one of you been to any cities in the world where you have got more dustbin than Singapore? Then everybody took a pause and say, actually, yeah. So sometimes the government reactions in a certain way spoil the citizen and took the responsibility away from themselves. And it become a spiraling downward of changing. Also, we become very narrow focused and very silo in our reaction. All right? Quite typically, we try to identify what's the problem and then we go and address the problem. So recently, I've read an email about a complaint of food poisoning in a school. And then I read the report. The, not only there was one store that was poisoning the children, a few other stores in that canteen of the school have crocodiles, have got this and that problem. And then I saw the report. MOH was there, you know, talking about this. Uh, POB was there to check the water, and we were NEA, were doing something, and so on and so forth. So we are very specific in the action that we want to do. But actually, what is the problem? The problem is extremely incompetent school leaders. It is the job of the principal and the vice principal in charge of admin to make sure that the school is in order, <laughs> including cleanliness and hygiene. It is actually not the role of government <laughs> to go into all those. Huh? You, see the, you see the difference? And then we also become very prescriptive in what we want people to do. When you want to be prescriptive, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. 10,000 things you're not supposed to do. And none of us can remember any of those things. But actually, if you think about it, what is the philosophy and thinking behind something? It is a lot easier to understand. Actually, there are, many of us come from different parts of the world. Uh, we come from different culture. We have different religion. We call our gods by different name. We worship in different setting. But someone pointed out, uh, actually, at the core of all religion, they call it the golden rule. The golden rule is, do not do unto others what you do not want others to do to you. In other words, don't do bad things. But that's not good enough. There is another flip side to the same thing is, do unto your others what you would like them to do to you. That means do nice things. <laughs> now, isn't it that the golden rule of every single religion? You tell me which religion doesn't preach that. 
So why is it that on Sunday we go to church, you know, on Friday we go to malls and all this thing else? I don't know where else. But we don't quite behave that way. So at the Hawker Centre, it's actually not about the trade return. Trade return is just a very specific action. The Hawker Centre is very busy. There are not enough cleaners to go around cleaning immediately. And if you don't dirty the table and you take away the tray, the next user will be able to use it immediately in a clean and comfortable environment. Let's be considerate. Be nice. <laughs> How much action does it take? How much effort does it take? By the way, taking a little bit of care not to spill the soup onto the table is a lot less effort than if you spill the soup and some poor cleaner have to come and clean it with all sorts of things, especially if you go on the floor as well. You see the things? And it all started with a very fundamental thing that, hey, please be considerate to one another. <laughs> and even when you're talking about sustainability and all this thing, it is about not consuming as though there's no tomorrow. Not a, it's not about just poisoning the air, not about causing global warming, and not about burning the e-waste, and then take the bottom ash and bury it in Pulau Samakau. Because Pulau Samakau is going to be a toxic dump. It's not habitable. Atuan said, start at source. <laughs> Come up with innovative policy that works. Reduce the source, then deal with it effectively. Don't pretend that if you incinerate and you take the bottom ash and you bury it, it's going to go away. Because then Pulau Samakau will not be usable in the future. One of the ministers challenged me. He said, Liang, can we make Pulau Samakau the future HDB housing estate? The prime area for people to want to beat to live there. Hey, Singapore is land scarce. We all complain about land prices being high and blah, blah, blah. Why don't we do something about it? Why don't we think 30, 40 years ahead? Help the next generation. I have one small observation with a little bit background of my country. Uh, we are from Government of India. We have uh, 7,933 towns and cities. Out of this, 59 are, 53 are million plus and 500 are 100,000 100, 100, plus. We generate a uh, lot of waste, all kind of waste. Uh, a good thing is that from last one decades, we at government of India level or a state government level, we put a lot of measures, a lot of restrictions, a lot of policies. We come out with a lot of policies and decisions, especially for use of plastic polythene bags. There are some, some states who completely ban uh, the use of poly uh, plastic polythene ban, and there's a heavy fine if you're using 50 or uh, 40, 50 Singaporean dollars. But here I have seen people are using very commonly uh, the plastic ban. I have just uh, small queries that uh, do you have any, any policy, any rules to restrict the same? Or if not, uh, what is your future? Because if you will not stop one day, it, 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 will, it will be a mess. Thank you. Plastic bags is non-biodegradable. It will stay there for hundreds of years, not thousands of years. But plastic bag has value in the sense that it is a resource that you can convert it into energy, electricity. So in a way, if you can get enough plastic bag, you can convert it into electricity. Therefore, there's some recycling. Okay, that's a fundamental principle. Look at Singapore. In Singapore, since 1999, almost all the waste from household, including plastic waste and so on and so forth, are collected and incinerated at the waste to energy plant to generate electricity. Okay, no dioxin is being emitted because of technology and so on and so forth. Be, be sure of that. Therefore, whatever plastic bag that is missed collection, if you like, leak out, to go to the sanitary landfill is very, very small proportion. Therefore, it is not a big problem in Singapore. We recycle it. You must recognize, we recognize the fact that plastic bag 
is very, very useful in terms of hygiene. 85%, about 85% of Hope Singaporean live in high-rise flat. And all of them in their kitchen as a rubbish chute to throw down. So can you imagine after dinner, you just your leftover food just throw into a rubbish chute and your rubbish chute will be dirty, full of cockroaches, rats and so on. Therefore, we promoted that you tie your food waste into plastic bag and then drop it down. It's clean. Now, having said that, Ministry of the Environment then recognized that it is not environmentally friendly to use excessive plastic bag. That's why the philosophy and the principle that is adopted, the strategy that adopted by the Ministry of the Environment or National Environment Agency then, I'm not sure about it now because I'm no longer <laughs> in the system, is take what you need. Don't be excessive about taking your plastic bag. That's all there is to it. A side story to this is very interesting. At that time, I was trying to get the supermarket why not charge them five cents or ten cents per bag? When I broach an issue with them, they said quite happy about it. So when I call up, I had a big meeting with NTUC Fair Price World Market Change with Cold Storage, Seng Shong, and all the whole lot of them. This was brought up again formally. Everybody said no. Unless the government legislated, so the level playing field. Uh, we don't want to look at this Singapore, when we want to do something, it must be the law. No, no, we don't do it. So therefore, what we do is that we just say, take what you need, don't be excessive plastic bag. That's the reason why there is no, we do not ban plastic bag in Singapore, we allow plastic bag to be used because plastic bag is general electricity. Arton, I, I beg to differ. <laughs> I beg to differ because things are not working. Things are not working. We have one of the highest consumption per capita of plastic bags. After a rain, you go and look into the drain and you look into a reservoir. About half of the rubbish are plastic bags. And if you go to Rifles Range Road, you go along any construction site, on the roadside, you will see plastic bags and plastic bags and plastic bags. Some of them accumulated rainwater and all this thing under the bushes. It is not working. And I think this is the kind of issue that I'm challenging my colleagues and my friends who are in the politics. Let's face the fact it is not working. Experience in Hong Kong, in London, and in India show that when you just levy a small charge to the plastic bag, the consumption dropped by at least 90%. You go to Hong Kong 7-Eleven, very few people pick up the plastic bag because you have to pay Hong Kong 50 cents, Singapore 10 cents. And in India, people can live very well without the plastic bag. So I don't think we should ban plastic bag because plastic bag do have some use. Uh, and you're right, we incinerate them. But I think we do have to do something. And uh, the su supermarkets are still having exactly the same stand. Uh, we spoke to actually four of the big ones. Three of them say we'll go along if the, the other, all of them go along. Then the last one say, no, I don't want to go along. Uh, why I don't want to go along? Because the wet market is still issuing it free. So everybody just point at each other and nothing is happening. And we are having all this littering and we are having all this. Finally, Taiwan told us, eh, one of the big impact of ch her small charts for plastic bag, it changes the way people consume. Because people become much more conscious when they take up something. Today, you go to NTUC Fair Price, by the way, they're very generous. Uh, would you like to have another one? Would you like to double pack it? You want to triple pack it? Huh? How many of you have the same experience? Put up your hand. You see the problem? Not only they are not controlling the use, they are encouraging people to pick up unnecessarily. So this is one of those policies that didn't work, and I think it's about time for us to look hard and then I say, let's try to find a way to make it work. All right. Can I just have a last say on this? <laughs> we started this plastic bags campaign thing in the, 
I think mid 80s or late 80s. During my time, we plucked the low hanging fruits first. We've done, we've done a bit at that point of time. Hey, I recognize a problem. There's still a problem. It, there, we have done certain part already, so there's further improvement to be made. Uh, my NEA colleagues, our former colleagues are here. I think, leave it to them. Your chairman is here. He just threw you a big challenge. Uh, we hope now your job to make sure that, you know, you charge with just passing back in order to get a 90% reduction. Thank you. Yeah, just make a final comment here. Um, actually, at SEC, we're working very closely with NEA on this subject matter, just like what Liak said. Uh, it's back to this item that I brought up in one of my slides. You know, you can see pay by weight. The entire ownership changes. So same thing in terms of the result for the recycling and as, as well as the result for plastic bag. There really, really is a strong need for us to change the way we think about plastic bags. Actually, quite interestingly, to add on, disruptive technologies are coming uh, on and it's coming in, in large scale, actually. Uh, you see a lot of little red mark trucks moving around, people are delivering the goods, uh, supermarkets have to shrink in size, you got the uh, Amazon.go, I think, uh, and a few other new concepts of supermarkets coming around the corner that would actually challenge these hypermarkets and the way they function. So hopefully through the changes of disruptive uh, platforms, that can actually, we can leverage that actually to change the mindsets of the consumers. I'm a believer in weakness as well as strength. So we all probably know someone who is very meticulous at something and because of that, when something falls short, they're very short tempered. So uh, bringing it back to this uh, uh, topic, uh, a lot of people have talked about Japan and how Japan has been, has a lot of environmental practices and they say it's incul inculcated in schools, but I differ because if you look a bit closer, um, Japan has one of the largest gender equality gaps in the whole world. It's ranked like 111 out of 148. And um, this is, this means that like the director level is like less than 2% of women. And so where are the women? The women are at home because you know, until only recently, maids are allowed in Japan. Uh, so that that home, that teaching, they're raising the children, they you know, caring for the elderly. And so, you know, that's Japan's weaknesses of strength, uh, the gender equality gap. So if you bring it to Singapore, uh, we have a very clean environment, but a lot of people say that our behavior is our weakness. And, um, and why? Because we have 200,000 maids, that is one in maybe five households. We have 70,000 cleaners cleaning our streets. So how, you know, from NEA, can we work in, a, I guess, a political climate when our, you know, minister, or, you know, the DPM in 2011 said that we have to respond to every single feedback and, and where cleanliness is our competitive advantage, how can we actually um, face the hard truths and maybe in order to change mindset we have to go through a period of you know some kind of hardship some kind of um, um, yeah hardship where our environment does go um, a bit dirtier because we have fewer cleaners we don't allow as many maids so these are the hard truths I, I understand we have to face them but like we, we work in a political climate when you know our top top bosses don't want to do anything that will that the lay person would complain about so this is my feedback uh, or, or this is my uh, observation that I would like you guys to address because you guys have been working with the top people and you guys probably know uh, what they think and what is important so yes that is my observation for you to address thank you <laughs> I'm not quite sure what the question is but I, I think that I mean you know, I, I think if you're tasked to clean up Singapore you're, or you're tasked to, 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 to maintain a, a clean and green Singapore, as a sociologist, I would say that, you know, that means that you have to come up with innovative in, in, in interventions. And interventions that are snapshot, quick fix, may not be sustainable. So at the end of the day, really, it's about do you have faith in Singaporeans? And if you don't, then that's very, very sad. 
prognosis. But if you do have faith in Singaporeans, I do have a lot of faith, particularly in young Singaporeans. I think that, you know, I I can't, I, you know, I don't want to put words in Atuan's mouth, but I have a lot of faith in young Singaporeans because I think that a lot of the new initiatives on a sustaining environment, on, you know, like, what, what else do they do? Well, aside from that, they take action. Yes. That's important. They're part of action. <laughs> so, I do think that we have to stop thinking that we are just a bad lot of eggs and then therefore, you know, it's always punitive action, but rather, Look at the environmental triggers to see what is it that makes us turn left and what is it that makes us turn right. So, for example, food waste. The problem with food waste is that we have this buffet culture. So we need to get rid of the buffet culture, right? Because buffet culture contributes to a big chunk of your food waste. So, so these, are, you know, these are environmental triggers. It doesn't render the individual in it a bad person or untrainable, unteachable. I'm not sure if Mr. Liao agrees with me, but... Uh, the Canadian literature says that it goes back to as far as 1987, published by the UN Commission on Environment and Development. Right? But the actual thinking could be ascribed as early as 1967 to Jane Jacobs. And she is very inclusive in her talking about sustainability because she includes sociology in it. And I think this is a problem with Singapore. Sociology has always been at the back seat for too long. And we talk about this and that. I think the key thing we do not seem to have a good handle on such human behavior. We are very good at coming with money, solution, the mechanics, the mechanization, the systems and all that. So I'm glad that Liat mentioned something which is close to my heart, biomimicry. We should really look at waste as a whole system rather than as an output of something to be managed or put away or burned away. Yeah? So, so I think uh, somehow maybe we have too much money, uh, we have too efficient a bureaucracy, so we always come up with a solution to tackle a problem. We never look at the whole thing as a system and say, look, how can we work with it? And I think there's another thing we have to be careful. Huh? The good and the bad and the ugly will always be with us. You can never get rid of the ugly. You just go to the ground. I'll give you an example. When I first went to China, I couldn't use a washroom. This is in the mid-80s. Now you go to China, most places, like let's say, the washroom facilities are better than a lot of places in Singapore. So they have gone ahead we have been quite complacent in paddling backwards. And the other thing I think, I, I could be just my visceral observation, before outsourcing of waste management, we were quite good. I think we did a good job of collecting our waste and managing it. But after the hue and cry to privatize it, I think they've done the worst job of it in the public realm. I know, maybe just my observation, but. I don't know what PhD has to say about that. I, I wear a bit of a hat because I'm like a life member of the chairman of the Waste Management Association. So um, on behalf of them, actually, there's 200 plus companies in the phone book. I mean, they're all trying to survive in terms of their business. Uh, but you are right. Your observation is right. Maybe it's the way that we've cut up a lot of the work. I had that side conversation with Liak as the chairman of NEA uh, just now, actually, quite recent. But I think the ownership, like I said, uh, has been outsourced. And maybe something needs to go back to the drawing board and have a good look at the whole thing again to say, have we empowered the operators to do more? Because I'm, I'm, I'm fairly disappointed that if I were to approach any of the waste operators today and said, can you come out and partner with me to look at recycling, to look at waste management, the answer would be a pushback, no, I don't have the money, I don't have the capacity, I don't have the space. And in the end, the partnerships that partner NGOs today are non-waste management companies. So this is a question that I pose back to the NEA to look into that. I would like to address the uh I'm a little bit concerned uh, as a former NEA officer, the current F officer, do I get you right by saying that you, uh, you face some constraints with your 
supervisors uh, that you want to do something, they face a constraint. Is that what you're trying to say? I guess it's more, um, there, there is also a resistance in the sense that um, because Singapore is clean and this is our image, that we'll stop at nothing to make it so. And this is like, you know, green, clean and green is our, is Singapore's image to the world. And you know how we go out to the public with our uh, zero waste nation mantra, and that is kind of a like it, it makes people believe that we are a zero waste nation where we're not we're not actually telling the the people that indeed we are a, not a zero waste nation we have so much landfill but then what we show the people is cartoons of like eco eva and that doesn't really change anyone's mindset uh so i do feel that there is resistance there is a need to preserve our image to the world and and we don't really like embrace sometimes a little bit of controversy, a bit of edginess. So that's and, and there is restraint sometimes because these are seen as, you know, rocking the boat. And a lot of people know that that's sometimes a term used um, um, when I try to say something like don't rock the boat. So I'm just wondering, what do you think? No one in this world is completely powerful and able to change things the way they want it. Not even Donald Trump. Yeah, right? Even the Prime Minister face constraint. All right, the ministers face constraint. Perm sex firm constraint. And so you do you. So if you expect the world to line up exactly the way you expect it and support you and smoothen things for you, it is not a realistic expectation. It is not necessarily because people are evil, people are trying to stop you and whatever it is. Sometimes it's because they have that background, they have that experience, they have that perspective which is different from yours. And it's perfectly okay to have different perspective. I'm a great admirer of Atuan. I've gone to him for many tutorials. And you can see his comment about plastic bags is different from mine. All right? Uh, I'm a great admirer of Dr. Liu, okay? Uh, I've gone to him for tutorial many, many times, right? And I think some of the things that he did is something that Singapore really must go back to. But I, I still don't like your ring road <laughs> because I get lost when I go around the ring road. But that's life. Okay, I hope you don't get irritated with me for not liking your ring road, right? But So what do you do? I think you owe it to yourself. Don't waste your life. Think through what is the right thing to do. Test your idea. It may never be completely right because everything that you do will be right to a certain percentage and wrong for a certain other perspective. Because everything has consequences, positive and negative. All right? So test your idea, see whether it works, it doesn't work. Number two, go and find the right partners. Agencies are agencies. Departments are departments. But there is no such thing as NPAC's view. No such thing as PUB view. I can tell you different people in PUB and different people in NPAC and different people in NEA have different view. And I dare even say that different ministers in different cabinet, uh, in the cabinet have different views. They may not publicly express their views openly, but they do have different perspective. Look for your partners. All right? And don't be big hated that you're always right. Be humble. All right? And then test it. Try it out. And then start things in a small way. Because very often when you try to do things in a big way, the risk is big. The, the fallback will be big. But if you do it in a small way, quietly, sometimes nobody will know. And then when you have accomplished something, there's some result. Yeah, yeah, then you tell, you tell the, the right people. And we all know the saying, right? Failures are, are often orphans, but success I have many, many parents. Right? So once you have small success, I can guarantee you, you have a lot of people up there trying to say that they, they are the one who came up with a great idea. And then if you're a young officer, be clever enough to say, yeah, yeah, that's a guy's great idea. Oh, hello. My name is Siang. I'm from NEA. Okay. Um, 
Actually, I was thinking to better control waste generation, right? We need to moderate our consumption and spending habits. So um, this is a question for all. Uh, should we reduce the number of shopping centers in Singapore? Thank you. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yes. Hi. So, uh, yes, we have too many shopping malls. I'm Tai Chong. I am Tai Chong. I'm a marine biologist uh, in, with the National University of Singapore. I'm also a lecturer in the College of Alice and Peter Tan. Uh, so, I teach environment, environment and the civil society uh, for my work. So, I just have two things. Uh, first one being a comment. I'd like to then challenge everyone here uh, to look at the plastic issue again. I think I, I respect, totally respect uh, Mr. Lowe's um, perspective. Uh, so the thing here is that let's consider three other points. First one, we are making the assumption that when it burns, it is totally environmentally friendly. It creates pollution. So you solve one problem, you create one more problem. Number one. Number two, we are assuming that the plastics in Singapore end up in the right places, but they don't. I do coasters clean up for Singapore and I challenge you to actually go down to Lim Chu Kang. I brought 20 students down within six, a span of 90 minutes. We collected 230 kg of trash, of which 70% of this are either plastics or styrofoam, all over. All right? So you have to be on the ground, and I totally resonate with what Mr. Liang has said. Go on the ground and take a look for yourself. What is the key problem? All right? So and the third thing here is that we're also assuming that plastics appear with a snap of our fingers, but they don't. There is amount of investment of resources required. So if we minimize the use of resources, we use less resources for the, you know, in, in, in its entirety. So these are some things that I hope all of us will, will come on and you know, uh, go on to it. And I strongly encourage everybody to go down and volunteer, to, to go down to uh, the ground and look, work out something with you. I volunteer with the SEC. Uh, so there are about 70 environmental groups here now in Singapore as we speak. So there's plenty of chances for you to go down and take a look. So the next, the, the question I want to raise now here is, if you, some of you have been to Timber Plus, it's a fantastic technology, they patented the retain, retaining of trays, right? So this is the first time I've been to Timber, uh, Timber Plus, people are queuing to return trays. Queuing, huh? so the, the, the cleaner uncles have nothing much to do. But this is one example of social innovation that we are looking at. And I think this is some of the common threads that we mentioned today. So rather than waiting for the government to do something, are there, maybe the panel can be able to share some of the social innovations that they've seen worked in other countries or in Singapore that doesn't require a very strong effort from the government and prescriptive effort to say, yes, this works, yes, this, this does not, and we should ban this, we should tax this, something that uh, social innovations that truly work for the environment. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bernice Ang uh, from Zero Labs. I'm one of the newbies to the World City Summit Young Leaders Network. Um, so part of my brain lives in the future and one of the things that I'm really uh, inspired by and excited about is um, the, the idea of cradle to cradle or circular economy. And uh, I mean, it kind of marries two of my big loves, technology and design. Um, but I also know that a lot of complex problems, the solutions are not uh, often or rarely are they purely technical or technocratic. So I'm curious uh, from the panelist perspective, what do you, um, what do you think are the barriers that explain why we aren't there yet? Or if we are on track, uh, then what do you see as the conditions that are very conducive for circular economy to be a reality? I'm going to try and combine the two of you together. I think it's all about innovation. Uh, your first part, talking about 70 NGOs. I'm, I'm really happy with that. That includes a lot of the international NGOs. Um, you're, you're actually preaching to the converted. There's quite a lot of you are the converted. Problem here is you've got to come down with me down to the heartland and you'll see the problem. The problem here is 90% of the voice of heartlanders die hard plastic bag owners. Until we get to a point where we have a conversation and say, we are not going to give you a plastic bag anymore, so deal with it. And, and that doesn't translate to votes. Sorry, but that's the, the issue right now, okay? So, but you're right, you're hitting on the nail. But I'd like to combine the two questions concerning innovation and circular economy or closing the loop, sometimes people call that. Um, that's, that is already happening. There's a lot of innovation brewing, but what we call uh, in NASA technology, if you look at it, is really, uh, you know, what we call innovation stage one to stage five. So they're 
really a lot of the green financing doesn't finance uh, innovation in the what we call I call it the the grey bucket area where it's trying to up upscale. You know, um, I'm mentoring a few NGO. Uh, uh, sorry, startup companies right now. So I understand their issues. Green financing only starts beyond uh, mezzanine level. So I'm really, really excited. The government had actually talked about carbon tax lately. And I had repeatedly, many times in front of the media, says, I'm really excited. When is it going to happen? And how is this going to feed back to the growth of the green innovation that is needed uh, in Singapore and maybe for the regional market as well. But akan datang, wait for it to happen. I'm sure something is going to happen out of it, but I, I'm looking for a direct interest uh, in, in a, a lot of innovative people out here who may join the public uh, private sector to start up a lot of innovation. Good question. Actually, if, if you study human behavioral science, all right, you can pick up a lot of ideas about what are the things that work and what are the things that do not work. I don't have time to give a lecture on human behavioral science. Huh? But these little small charges for a plastic bag, all right, it doesn't kill anybody. And it's a perspective, right? Uh, no, nobody's going to go bankrupt if NTUC FairPrice charge them 10 cents for the plastic bag. And besides, they have an options of bringing uh, yesterday's plastic bag uh, to, to use for today. And you know what? I used to run Alexander Hospital and Kutikwat Hospital. In the about 15 years ago, we started charging for plastic bag at our pharmacy. Every single day, we charge over a thousand people for the plastic bag. Now you would assume that people will jump up and down and threaten to kill me, right? It never happened. And by the way, our hospital were top in the patient satisfaction survey every single year, even though we charge them for plastic bags. The world is going to collapse if you charge them for plastic bag. But I think we have a lot of irrational fear. Oh, the public will react. Nah, nah, nah. Never happened. Some of us spent three years trying to persuade Ministry of Education to ask the children to clean the school. Okay. And there was a lot of fear that you know the parents are going to complain and blah blah blah. Guess what? Nothing happened. In fact, many parents say, wonderful. We couldn't get our children to clean the toilet at home. So if you can get them to clean the toilet, good. It turned out that parents appreciate it. They didn't object it. So I think civil servant should not try to second guess the politician. And second thing, civil servant should persuade the politician to do the right thing. After all, that is what the value add of civil servants are for. Because if you are merely there to second guess and jump up and down to ape what the, you think the politicians say, you have had no value. In fact, I will call you a glorified clerk. <laughs> 